Welcome to the lecture on the economist's basic model of human behavior. Although many people think that economics is a subject that concerns itself with business and finance, economics is actually a study of human behavior. A knowledge of economics is certainly important in understanding business and finance, but in most colleges and universities, economics is in the social sciences department rather than the business department. But we can't even hope to explain all of human behavior. There are about seven and a half billion of us on the planet, and each of us is infinitely complex. So we're going to need a model. You've seen the video explaining what a model is and why economists use them. Now let's look at the economist's basic model of human behavior. As you know, models are necessary when trying to figure out humans because people are just too difficult to understand. And you're also aware that models are simplified explanations that are constructed by ignoring certain information. The best way to construct a model is by throwing away the least relevant information first and continue to do so until the basic relationships reveal themselves. A model clears out the noise that muddies and obfuscates real life, and it does so by making assumptions. The most frequently used assumption in economic models is ceteris paribus. That's a Latin term for all other things remaining constant, even though in real life they almost never do. This assumption relieves us from having to consider unusual or anomalous circumstances which arise from time to time in real life. We eat an ice cream cone, for example, because it will taste good and leave us satisfied. But in considering whether to buy it or not, we assume away the possibility that there might be a dead bug inside or a piece of broken glass. We are, without even thinking about it, constantly constructing models to guide our behavior. In this case, our model would be ice cream cones make us feel good, ceteris paribus, and therefore we should buy it. The assumption of ceteris paribus means no dead bugs, no broken glass, no thermonuclear explosions while we're eating it, you don't get struck by lightning, none of that stuff. Let's consider the most basic assumptions that economists make regarding human behavior, although you no doubt know somebody that doesn't conform to them all. First, an individual's needs and wants are greater than that which can be satisfied by his finite set of resources. He will never reach a point where he achieves such a high level of satisfaction that he can no longer improve his state of being. He just doesn't have the resources, the time, the energy, the money, etc. Because he doesn't have enough resources to satisfy all of his needs and wants, he must choose among alternatives. Which needs and wants will he satisfy, and which of his needs and wants will remain unsatisfied. The term allocate is a popular word among economists. It just means applies or spreads out or distributes for a specific purpose. You'll see that word many times this semester, so you better get used to it. An individual is constantly seeking to allocate his resources in a way that maximizes his pleasure or satisfaction. And he will continually reallocate, reallocate, and reallocate again his resources until his utility is maximized, given, of course, his resource constraint, at which point he is in equilibrium. Utility is the economist's word for pleasure or satisfaction. Equilibrium just means at rest or no tendency towards change. When one allocation is chosen, another possible allocation is sacrificed. That's because the resources are limited. The individual perceives the best alternative allocation 
that is the best one that is sacrificed as the cost of that choice. Economists, as you might have guessed, have a special definition for the word cost. We usually think of costs in terms of accounting costs, as in, how much did that shirt cost you? But economists think of costs in a little bit different way, because people respond, even without realizing it, to economic costs rather than accounting costs. In considering the various possible ways in which we can allocate our resources, people weigh the benefits against the costs for each alternative. If the benefits of doing something exceed the cost of doing it, it would cause our utility to go up, so you do it. If the cost of doing something exceeds the benefits, doing it would cause our utility to go down. Even without realizing it, we are constantly comparing the costs and benefits of doing things. Should I get up from this computer and go into the kitchen and get a snack? It would taste real good and provide me with a lot of utility. But I'd have to expend a lot of energy to walk from here into the kitchen. Plus, consider the time required to make the snack and actually eat it. I could be playing a lot of solitaire games on the computer during that time or visiting my Facebook page or watch a lot of cute cat videos on YouTube. Would the time and energy expenditure be worth the benefits I'd get from the snack? If so, I'll do it. If not, I won't. Oh, and right now, my ankle is itching. But is it worth the effort to scoot my chair out, bend down and scratch it, then scoot my chair back under my desk? Nah. I just let it itch and hope it goes away soon. Our sixth assumption about human behavior is that individuals respond to incentives in fairly predictable ways. If the cost of doing something goes up, for example, you'll probably be less likely to do it. If the benefits of something goes up, you'll probably do more of it. Economists are fond of saying, when you tax something, you get less of it. When you subsidize something, you get more of it. The more predictable the response, the more accurate and valid will be the model. You may notice that sometimes people do things that may appear to be irrational. That is, they do things for which the costs seem to outweigh the benefits, causing their utility to go down. For example, they might donate money to a charity. Don't they realize that they could be buying a lot of stuff with that money, stuff that would give them a lot of utility? Or they may spend an afternoon going door to door, collecting money for the ASPCA or some other worthy cause. What's wrong with them? Don't they realize that they could be using that time to go to the movies or play golf or take a nap or maybe earn some money somewhere? Or they could take part in a protest march for a clean environment. Again, they could be doing lots of things with that scarce, precious, limited time that would provide them with utility. Why would they spend it in this way? These are examples of what an economist would call moral and altruistic behaviors. When you behave morally, that means you do something just because it seems like the right thing to do. The word altruism means that other people's happiness makes you happy. So when you give money away that you could have spent on yourself, or you do things that make other people happy, is this behavior irrational? And does it contradict the economist's model of human behavior? Answer, no. If you asked an economist, why does someone act morally? They say, sometimes people get utility just from doing the right thing. An economist might also explain altruistic behavior by saying, sometimes people get utility from making other people happy. Moral behavior is rational when the benefits exceed the cost. Is teaching a moral act? 
Well, I think you'd agree that it is certainly a noble act, but is it moral? I chose teaching as a career because I not only enjoyed talking about the subject of economics, but I also enjoyed imparting what I believed then to be my vast amounts of wisdom. See, I thought I knew everything. And somehow otherwise affecting people's lives in a positive way. Even though I had more financially lucrative opportunities elsewhere, I would spend all my time and energy so that my students would know what I knew. And for that reason, I would say that teaching for me was a moral act. Later, however, as diminishing returns inevitably set in, and I realized that I didn't really know it all, teaching, like most other jobs, became a bit of a drudge. Being the sage on the stage wasn't as exciting as it used to be. Plus, I'd given these lectures thousands of times before, and they were getting a bit boring. I couldn't wait to end a class and get to the golf course. But I continued to do it anyway for the paycheck. I was well ensconced in the profession by that time and didn't feel like bearing the cost of starting a new career. So during this time, I'd say that teaching for me was not a moral act because I didn't do it to bestow benefits on others, but rather I did it for the paycheck. I did it to bestow benefits upon myself. Now, in the latter stages of my career, I'm not doing it for the paycheck anymore, although I am accepting the pay. I've pretty much got enough money to do anything I want. The bitter irony, of course, is that I'm so old, I, I don't want to do anything. But even though I'm old enough to retire, I continue to teach anyway because for some reason I've begun enjoying it again. Although I could be doing other things with my time and energy, the benefits of bestowing wisdom and positively affecting the lives of other people now seem to exceed the cost. So for right now, I'd say that for me, teaching is a moral act. And by the way, it doesn't hurt that in this day and age, so many courses are taught online. So the cost of teaching has gone way down. I don't have to get up at Odark 30 anymore and shave and get dressed, fight the traffic on the beltway, and then take that long walk from the parking lot to my office, usually in the cold and rain. I can just walk from my bedroom into my den, turn on the computer, and teach a class in my pajamas. I could even drink a beer if I wanted to. Altruistic behavior can be rational for the same reason, when the benefits exceed the costs. I spent a boatload of money putting my three daughters through college and paying for their weddings. I could have bought a top-of-the-line Maserati with all that money and been the coolest dude at the Assisted Living Center's shuffleboard matches. So why did I sacrifice that opportunity on behalf of my kids? In a word, altruism. Yes, sacrificing the Maserati and my status among the rest of them old geezers was very, very costly to me. But I got more utility from my daughter's happiness than I would from the car or any other good or service that I could have purchased with that money. So, in this case, blowing all that money on my daughter's weddings and their college education, perfectly rational. If we were to dive further into the behavior of the individual, we'd be doing microeconomics, the economics of the individual. But this is macroeconomics, an examination from the very same perspective of the behavior of societies. Don't wait too long before watching the next video on macroeconomics.